inside the board and free from the hive mind, this is Rex Bear hosting Lead Project. The Lead Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leak Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on-scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. Tonight's guest is relocation expert, Marshall Masters. Here at the Leak Project, we will be discussing the latest intel on Nibiru, the infamous Planet X, also something I feel could be very important here in the near future, rapid construction of survival communities, structures or bunkers that are durable, dependable, self-sufficient, and obtainable in a short amount of time. Marshall, it's great to have you on the show with us tonight. How are you this evening? Great, and it's a pleasure to be back. The last show we did was really popular with my uh, readers and listeners. Got a lot of compliments on it, and so... Uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to let's uh, let's take the varnish off. <laughs> let's, let's get her done. Yeah, I mean it was it yeah was really good information. Last time we spoke, we talked about some biblical prophecies, possible end times, Nibiru, and just a ton of information. Your website www.yowusa.com has an enormous amount of information on multiple topics such as survival communities, the latest information on Nibiru and also spiritual books that you've put together. The ones that are coming to mind off first of them on my mind is the uh, In It for the Species. Uh, but let's get into, first off, these structures that you're talking about putting together in these communities. Uh, you know, how is something like this done? Are you wanting to go at a, a, a grand scale or just specific areas around the globe? Well, what I'm doing right now is focusing on helping the ones I can. You know, for 15 years now, I've been talking about a dark cloud coming. Well, I want to focus on the silver lining. And so I've done two things. One, I've co-founded uh, a church called Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis with Jennifer Burns. And it's a non-denominational faith-based organization. And it's really set up for people who have been in awareness most of their lives and are feeling isolated and ostracized. Uh, yeah, I just want them to know they're not alone. And you know, it was Jennifer that really pointed out to me uh, that I've always been trying to help these folks throughout the years. I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands of them. And I've always just wanted them to know, it, you know, you're not alone. It's I can see for them that they can feel alone. They can get picked on. Uh, myself, you know, my my work is my life. I do this 24-7, so to speak, seven days a week. And so I'm always talking to people who are in awareness, and I never have that feeling of being alone. And, you know, one lady actually summed it up for me beautifully. She said, I'm a healer casting my pearls before swine, and I walk amongst them, healing them, and yet I cannot heal myself. And so we want to help them, but we also want to be able to gather them together into communities and sustainable communities of 100 or more people. And so right now I've got something called the Dome Community Working Group. And I've got a wonderful team of really motivated people who are working with me on this. And yeah, it's a struggle, but everyone understands that. And it's also something where we feel a sense of mission with Creator and in planning and creating the leadership necessary for these communities. I have spent the entire summer crisscrossing the country doing regional reconnaissance all the way from Northwest Minnesota to Northeast Washington. And uh, it's been interesting what I have found along the way, that there is a very strong perceptible shift in the country. For example, one of the things that Jennifer noticed when we were traveling was that we saw more American flags on the sides of chemical plants than we did on t-shirts. You know, stop and think about wow. that. Uh, what was amazing for me, particularly up in the Northwest, was uh, how the people up there have shifted. And because I was always asking everybody, everywhere I went, 
you know, well, how's the weather and whatever's going on. Now, this has been a horrible summer with record droughts, record heat waves, record fire seasons. And there was no bravado. No bravado. Oh, it's just a bad year. Next year will be better. Everyone I talked to, and I don't care if it was a rancher, a truck driver, a, you know, a waitress, a hotel clerk, everyone knew the earth is changing for the worse, and it's not going to get better. And they were all deeply unsettled about it. And so there is this new awareness that is coming around and to the country. And so it was, uh, it was a very sad trip. We saw a lot of devastation from the fires. Uh, we passed through cities where they have chemical plants that are processing the uh, what they're what all these fracking wells are bringing out of the ground, and like in Billings, Montana, and it's just oh my god, awful. You pass through there, and it just almost starts to burn your uh, nostrils. Your eyes start to uh, burn. It just was awful. It's like we wanted to get through Billings as fast as we could, and so when we got back to Sparks. It was this trip that left me sad because of what I had seen and how things are changing. So uh, the bravado is gone. People are waking up. I saw that as a huge difference. And I think things are moving in that direction. So, you know, with doing the Dome Community Working Group, what we're really doing right now is creating the expertise pool and strategic solutions for what I call rapid deployment communities. There's not going to be the time of, you know, two years or three years to build out a large community. You're going to have to be able to build these communities out in two or three months. And that's what we're doing. And so, uh, you know, the core concept, building concept of the communities will be concrete domes. And we like the dome technology that was developed by David South of uh, monolithic domes in Italy, Texas. And that's what we're doing on that. And uh, the... Basically, the Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis will be a way for us to gather together the people who are in awareness and to help them. So it's one of those things It's uh, we're going on faith, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. So <laughs> right. that's what we're doing. But I'm, you know, I'm tired of this chicken little nonsense. Well, and your location, uh, your headquarters for your church or um, the, where it's located, do you have the the dome there as well or multiple domes no no we don't you know right now what we're really doing with the working group is is just pulling together people who have different uh, avenues of expertise so we're going through all of the strategic planning right now in other words how do you bring a community together of 100 people uh, what technologies can we do on a rapid deployment basis so as things progress all right people are going to be waking up and they're going to be looking for solutions. And this is not the time to start doing a lot of research. You need to be able to hit the ground running. So that's what we're doing with the working group right now is putting ourselves in a position that when people are waking up and they're ready to actualize that we can say, here you go. And actually what we're going to do with this is it's not proprietary. I'm not interested in you know, one of these, aha, you got to come to us and buy it. What we're actually doing as a working group is taking all this information, pulling it together, creating a unified threat matrix, which is the basis of what you're going to use for your planning. And all that information will be published in a substantial new book I will put out this year. And uh, the title of that will be, well, the working title of the book right now is Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, Getting Through It with Family, Friends, and Faith-Based Organizations. Because at this point, uh, I believe that the best chances for people in terms of survival are going to be by organizing through faith-based organizations. FBOs have a real huge advantage. One, uh, an FBO has got an established hierarchy, uh, you know, and this is one of the things that you see in a lot of for-profit and also non faith-based organizations that are intent on survival is that you get into power struggles. With an FBO, you're not going to have the power struggles because you have an existing chain of command that people will respect. That's really important. Uh, the second thing is that with a faith-based organization, they can pull resources together quickly, real quickly. 
okay? And if you're doing a for-profit operation, you know, every step along the way, you got to make sure you're protecting the investor's money and they're going to see a return and all of that. With a church, a faith-based organization, it's, hey, we're going to go do this. And things just start happening. And they happen quickly. And then another thing that FBOs have a real significant advantage with is that they have a diversity of talent, a huge diversity of talent. And people don't realize that. But you go to a church and the person next to you is, you know, if you're a dentist, they could be an electrical contractor. The guy next to you is, uh, you know, in the construction trade. The lady in front of you is a doctor. Someone behind you specializes in aquaponics systems. In other words, that's the beautiful thing about a church. It brings people from numerous walks of life. Well, that's excellent. And then you also have folks that have come to be able to be innovative and to take initiative and show things. You know, you got, you know, you got that little old lady that, boy, every year she runs one heck of a killer bake sale, raises a lot of money, and, you know, She's got that initiative. She's got that gumption. And so you're bringing that kind of talent as well. So that's the reason why I think in terms of late stage deployment, faith-based organizations, churches in particular, have a huge survival advantage. For the rest, I see a lot of problems. I look at the commercial offerings and, man, it's just, it's just not good. Uh, you see, first off, there's... Uh, one big thing that's popular is that they use these pipes, all right, because these big pipes that you use for irrigation and culverts and whatnot convert very well and they're very inexpensive. The problem with them is that you can't bury them that deep in the ground. And while under a, I would say, uh, a Cold War threat matrix, it, you want to be at least five feet under the ground, and what we're looking at, you want to be 10 feet under the ground. And that's not something I would want to be uh, 10 feet under the ground in a corrugated tube. But also, you have a corrugated tube that you look at the pictures, and people are sitting there in their little bunks with big smiles, and they're sterile white little tubes. These things are about as inviting and about as comfortable as a World War II submarine. Right. And, you know, the crews in World War II knew that every 90 days they'd have to go back to base for torpedoes and fuel. But if you're going to be in that bunker for a few years, holy schmoly. I mean, uh, what will happen is those things are going to turn into suicide tubes. And then you have the other commercial structures, which are these big uh, converted military bunkers. And these are single large rooms that were designed for taking a missile impact and surviving through that. They weren't designed to survive a sinkhole or a major fault fracture. And the thing of it is, is that they take these things and they turn them into basically glorified wood mahogany dormitories. And the designs are often awkward because of the layout so you could be on one side of the door, you know, you could be in the sleeping quarters and you'd have to pass through the entire sleeping quarters and kitchen area and dining area to get to the bathrooms, you know, which is really not pleasant in the middle of the night. And you don't know who's going to wind up in the sleeping room next to you. You know, it could be somebody with the worst case of sleep apnea in the history of humankind, and that's going to go right through those thin walls. Or it could be a drug dealer who... Uh, you know, has brought a nice stash of drugs to get through the end times with. And, of course, all of these companies say you know, they screen everybody. And let's be honest, when it's for profit, the screening is, does the check clear the bank? Right. And these are the problems that I see with a lot of these structures. And the reason why we went with concrete domes is concrete domes are ancient and they take a licking and keep on ticking. And the way we're designing our communities when we come out with our book is that it's not going to be put everybody in one huge honking dome. That's the cheap way to do it. That's return on investment. That's not the way to survive the coming tribulation. It is to put people, we organize it, and what we use as a general rule of guide and one of the properties we look at is a minimum of 100 acres 
on a basis of one person, one acre. That's a simple rule. More acreage is nicer, but one person, one acre. Then what you do is you take that community of people and divide that up into shires, all right, where you would have 30 to 50 people in a shire, maximum. And a shire is a collection of domes. So you might, in a total Finnish community, have two dozen domes, smaller domes, but spacious and comfortable to live in, and other arrangements. But the point is that they're highly survivable. They have multiple ingress and egress tunnels. You have something where people can you know, have a quality of life. What we're planning into these things is just you know, not a huge room where you can sit there and play cribbage and lament, you know, the end of your life as you're eating MREs. Uh, those people are going to, I call them bunker bunnies, they're not going to do very well. And uh, because there will be people on the surface who are, well, basically just going to turn them into a food source once they come up from underground. They'll smell their healthy bodies from a mile off and uh, then they're going to die badly. And for anyone that thinks that's laughable, you ought to go and get a movie by, it's with Viggo Mortensen, called The Road. And I will tell you, as someone who's been researching in this topic for many years, uh, The Road is absolutely the best movie to watch to help prepare you mentally for the kind of things that we're going to face. And, uh, and, I, and I can also tell you, watching The Road for me is just heartbreaking. I, it's hard. It's just really, really hard. I have to push myself to watch it because it's so realistic, and I know it's so realistic, and uh, that's pretty tough. But this is the way it's going to be. Now, that's one of the reasons why in the communities we're planning, we're also building in, uh, you know, this emphasis that everybody has on two-year stockpile of MREs and packaged food and all of that. That's not going to get you through the tribulation because the minute you package and can food, it's dead food. I don't care if it's organic, the best quality organic on the face of the earth, packaged and canned food is dead food. And that means that if you're really going to do well, if you're going to thrive in that kind of environment, you need to be able to work fresh fruit into it. And that's the reason why, you know, one of the things we're doing exhaustively is looking at various hydroponic, aquaponic, and hothouse growing systems because folks are going to have to be able to grow food indoors. And that's going to be important. But also they're going to have to have fun. You know, you need a, you need a Saturday night square dance, all right? Uh, you need a place to go get a, you know, a hot steam bath and get the stress off and talk with somebody. So these communities are really not intended for surviving the end of this civilization. What we're doing in our design is that we are creating communities that are about a clean slate for the beginning of the next civilization. That's really our vision, that you just don't go huddle in the bunker. You're going to go crazy. You've got to have a life. You've got to have hope for the future. You need to have some joie de vie, some joy of living. It's really important. And so that's what we're really factoring into our designs so that when these communities come together, they snap together and they then can start working on having a good life, making a good life. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to go on some kind of naive kumbaya arrangement where you just are going to say, well, we're going to be wonderful and we're going to be nice and the universe is going to protect us. Eh, no, 10 down, Kitty Carlisle, wrong answer. Uh, you're going to have to defend yourselves as well. And that's something that people have to factor in. So there's a lot to look at. There's a lot that we're working on. And, uh, you know, myself, um, I'm not worried about where I shelter through this. I have several invitations from folks that are well along in their advanced planning and already have facilities. It's not a problem for me, but my mission is not about me. My mission is I'm in it for the species because I see this on a much broader spectrum. This is just not about survival. You know, to be honest with you, I'm in my 60s. I've had a good life and 
if I didn't have a higher purpose, a higher calling to what I'm doing, I would well, you know, I just want to go live in ground zero. I'd be one of the first to go. I wouldn't well, struggle. And but then, I, have, I have a purpose. Let me just jump in here real quick, Marshall. You, you bring up the faith-based communities, and I can see so many different levels of uh, greatness with that type of synchronicity amongst everybody uh, at so many different levels. And have you been able to put together what a price point would cost to actually have a community of, you know, 10 or 20 or just to build one of these on an acre of land and to put everything together that goes with it to be self-sufficient? Have you been able to price that out? It's going to depend on what your options are, how you're going to do it and what it's going to cost you for manpower. But in materials alone, I would venture to say it's about $30,000 a person. That's pretty affordable. For what it is. Yes. For what it is. For what it is. That that is, you know, everybody putting their shoulder to the wheel. If you got to go out and hire construction companies, and uh, you're, you know, you're not doing, you're doing it through a for-profit model, uh, easily, easily uh, on a what I would call a bare bones basis, fifty thousand a head, pushing towards a hundred thousand, depending on how, where, you know, all the different variables. So. That's the reason why, you know, when we look at it, if, if it's a church, okay, and the rabbi, the pastor, the minister, the priest, whatever, stands up and says, folks, we got to do this. We got to pull together. We got to ask God for wisdom, take this plan and rock with it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> when people are motivated that way, they can do amazing things, amazing things. So as far as I'm concerned, if a church is going to go out and organize to do this, if it's God's will, it's God's bill, and it'll work. Right. And another thing you brought up at the beginning of the interview, how you've traveled the country quite extensively recently and have talked to different people about the, you know, the weather and what's going on in their area. Mm -hmm. so, you know, myself, I've also traveled approximately two-thirds of the country this year by a car. And I have a, a military-grade Geiger counter built into my watch. It's an MTM watch. You can pick them up for about 1500 bucks, and it keeps track of the radiation levels wherever you go. And the reason I picked this watch up was because after Fukushima, there was so much stuff on the Internet saying everybody's going to die from radiation that you know, I really wanted to know for myself how much radiation was around me. But one thing that I found uh, that I find very fascinating and not in a good way is over the past two years, the radiation levels out here in San Antonio, Texas have doubled, literally. And, um, and you know, now you'll see it at 0.15 microsieverts, which overall isn't real high, but where it was two years ago, it's, it's double and it's been uh, consistent. It's not like just little spikes of raises, it's, it's consistently going up. And mm -hmm. around the country, levels have changed as well. But with the information that you have, uh, do you think that that's based upon the chemtrails depleting the atmosphere, specific radiation leaks in areas, or what's going on? Well, I think that first off, Fukushima is a nuclear forest fire. That's in uh, that it's a volcano. They're just not going to put it out, and you're already seeing that now. Further west in the country, they're seeing higher radiation readings that are steadily increasing. Uh, one of the things on my website at yowza.com for those that go on, and uh, when I got back from my trip, I was in Yellowstone and I was poisoned by uh, geoengineering aerosol spray. And the article is geoengineering volcanoes to rain death upon us. And what I explained in the article was, uh, you know, we came through uh, South Dakota. We were wanted. I wanted to see Mount Rushmore. Never had seen it. That's a cool uh -huh. area. It is. Oh, the Black Hills are just, it's just beautiful there. I was really glad we went and we stayed at a wonderful hotel. I enjoyed the visit. Mount Rushmore was just simply spectacular. The day was beautiful. The sky was absolutely clear blue. I hadn't seen such a beautiful sky in so long. Nice fluffy clouds. Uh, it was just astounding. And people were happy, moving around easily, chipper, delighted. It was really great. You know, it, it felt like America from 20 years ago. And then, you know, we made our way into through Wyoming and uh, then we went into Montana and back into Wyoming for Yellowstone. And when we were in the park, 
what we noticed was that the chemtrail spraying was absolutely a solid cap. I mean, the sky above us was a solid cap. And when it would split, when you'd see a split in the cap, a jet would literally fly right into that split and spray it shut. And that, I've been watching the spraying for years, all right? When I founded Yowza.com back in 1999, I knew about it. At that time, I was told if I started reporting on chemtrails that I would wind up in an unmarked grave in the desert. Thankfully, <laughs> that's changed thanks to guys like Dane Wigington. God, he's my hero. Yeah, he's a good and guy. He is. Boy, he's first rate. And um, and then we were at Mammoth Geyser. I just wanted to get some video B-roll. And so Jennifer was with me, and she went in to shoot some video. And she, the sulfur fumes got to her a little bit. And, you know, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of advice given out there. If the sulfur bothers you, just get out of it. Don't stay in it. And so she did, and I said, well, let me see if it bothers me, and I went in, and the sulfur wasn't bothering me, and so I shot the video and took my time, came out, and then a few hours later, I was really feeling it, and it really hit me, and I was affected like everyone else that I was seeing around me in the park. Uh, interestingly enough, a few days earlier when we had been in Mount Rushmore, uh, one, of the, one of the things I heard in the hotel about people who typically visit there, they have a term for them. They, they call them newlyweds and nearly deads. And so that's what you have, a bunch of married people and uh, a lot of senior citizens. So at Yellowstone, same, same kind of folks, you know, same kind of tour buses, newlyweds, newly deads. Except at Mount Rushmore, the nearly deads were bopping around, lively, having a good time, enjoying each other, engaged, moving easily, moving naturally. At Yellowstone, they were like tin men that needed to get their joints oiled, and uh, they just seemed like in a Prozac haze. They were all dazed. They weren't interacting with each other. I didn't see smiles on faces. They just were moving and awkwardly, and in some cases, you could see it was just walking was painful for them. And this was throughout the whole park. And that night we went and stayed with some friends up in back in Montana. We drove back up into Montana and uh, he's an organic chemist, works in the mining industry. And he really is, uh, understands what's happening with the chemtrail spraying very well. And he said that uh, what they've done is not only, you know, the aluminum, the barium and all of these other things that they have that are just a witch's brew, they've added sulfur to it. And he said the sulfur came down from the spring, combined with the sulfur coming up from the geyser. And he said, so what you had was a ground level layer of uh, all of this sulfur with the chemtrail aerosol embedded into it. And he said, if you've been aerosol poisoned, you're going to know it in the morning. And I was already feeling it that night. Uh, my joints were starting to hurt. I was feeling... Yeah, in a haze. Uh, I, I couldn't, short-term memory was affected, couldn't uh, connect my thoughts all that clearly. Um, it was kind of tough, and I had a bad night sleeping, and in the morning, boy, that was it. Oh, my God. My body, from the tip of my skull to my toenails, was just one solid ache. Bones, joints, everything. Everything ached. And... Um, I just was feeling awful in so many different ways and went up and he explained to me at that point, he said, yeah, you've been poisoned by the chemtrails and it takes some time for it to work its way out. And so sitting there having breakfast and I mean like one cup of coffee after another, yeah, put another pot on, put another pot on, <laughs> you know, I was just trying to get my mojo back and it was like, woo, I was just slammed. And here's what's really happening. Uh, volcanoes, interestingly enough, have magma chambers, are very active. Magma chambers generate something called an ion vortex. And so what they have done is, if, as you know, is they have moved the jet stream. The reason why California, all of the Northwest, has uh, had all the terrible droughts, uh, fires, wells going dry and so forth, no rain, is that the Gulf, you know, they've moved the jet stream over 
jet stream used to come down over the Pacific, then come straight in to actually where the Golden Gate Bridge is in the Northern California in the Bay Area. Well, it doesn't. Now it comes down, goes over the top of British Columbia, and then comes back down the side of the mountains. And that's the reason why the jet stream now is going over into uh, the Yellowstone area. Well, moving the jet stream had a real advantage for them because <clears throat> what they do is they do a very, very heavy aerosol spray above the magma chamber. And the aerosols, as they're falling to earth, most of that aerosol that they're spraying is actually carried back aloft by the ionic vortex, which is very powerful coming off of Yellowstone. It is carried high, way up into the upper atmosphere, where then it caps out, floats back down, comes down into the air currents, and it's being distributed all across the country, as probably as far as Chicago. And so what they're doing is using Yellowstone as a big aerosol sprinkler, if you will, a distribution system. And that was the reason why I was poisoned, and that's what I learned when I was there. And so uh, there's just a, I agree with Dane. It's a situation where this is like an onion. Every time you peel a layer, it's just another layer to cry over. Well, and it's, it's as if these chemtrails are just completely depleting the ozone. And I often wonder if that's the reason the radiation levels are spiking on a consist or, you know, increasing consistently is the fact that there's more radiation from the sun and the stars and space, basically, that's, you know, it, it's not being blocked as good anymore. I mean, if you look at the sun now for even a quarter of a second, it's, it's blinding. 10, 20 yes. years ago, you could, you know, look at it for a couple of seconds and it's sure it's not good for your eyes, but it's not going to be, it was just more yellow and it wasn't nearly as intense. Right. No, the luminance has increased and that is, you know, that's definitely there. And this is part of what is happening to our planet. The luminance has been increasing because it's in response to the approach of the nemesis system. And that's what's causing that. The chemtrail spraying and everything else that's going on is is just, I guess the best way to say it is that we have crossed the threshold. It's no longer about finding a single causality, a single smoking gun. All right. We are in a situation where we have systems that are in chaos. You know, this is basically what I see happening to the world around us is just pure physics. It's called entropy. Systems that are out of balance, out of harmony with other systems start collapsing and failing. And, you know, and it turns into a helter-skelter thing. Uh, a good way to think about it is imagine you've got a marble tabletop. And on your marble tabletop, you have a whole bunch of spinning tops, you know, like children's spinning tops. And they're all sitting there and they're spinning beautifully, just right in place. Zoom, 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 zoom. And then you get one top that all of a sudden, for some reason, starts to skitter and stumble. And it just starts swaying back and forth across the table, smacking into the other tops. What happens? Chaos. And so that is what I'm really seeing, is that we are going into a time of ecological chaos. And honestly, I don't see that it's recoverable. We're past the point of recovery there's just too much insanity going on. And what I see really more to the point of all of this, because people shake their heads and they're going, this isn't smart. Why is this happening? This isn't smart. Where's the leadership? We should be doing something about this. Well, the reason why we're not doing something about it is here's the simple truth. The agenda is to ensure the maximum dieback of the human species. And this is, you know, gosh, uh, this is the ugly truth that is so hard for people to look at. It's so inhumane. But I see it. I see it. And I understand it. And I understand it from perhaps a unique perspective. Other people don't. And back during World War II, all of my family in Europe, on my mother's side, every man, woman, and child, died in the concentration camps. And I've spent a good portion of my life wondering how many of them, just even as they were in the cattle cars going to places like Auschwitz, saying, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. These people can't be this barbaric. But that is the truth of it. And 
the reason why they want to reduce the population is control. Is you know, uh, Brzezinski, who was a former, uh, I think Brzezinski was, as I recall, it's a big new Brzezinski. He was uh, national security advisor to Jimmy Carter. Also, he uh, endorsed Obama in 2007. And Obama said Brzezinski is one of our most outstanding thinkers. And in a speech he gave in 2008, he said, it is easier to kill a million people than it is to control them. Well, stop and think about that. We go through a flyby the Planet X system. Now, the elites have already got their bunker systems, their deep underground military bases. And we know about this. The information's been disclosed. You know, I've often said, hey, you know, when you see Gulfstream jets, corporate jets, lining the tarmac at Denver International, like a bad case of the measles, dying time is near because that's the elites going to ground. All right. Well, they're going to go to ground. Now, towards the end of the Planet X flyby, towards the end of the tribulation, and I document all of this step by step. I lay it out in my book, Being in it for the Species. That's what that book is all about. It tells people step by step, this is exactly what's going to happen during the tribulation, so you can avoid it. So you can be elsewhere. And more importantly, you understand the timing of how the events will unfold, which gives you a, a massively huge advantage. And most people are not going to have that advantage. Virtually none. They're not going to see it coming. They're going to build, rebuild, be crushed, because this tribulation is going to come in a series of cataclysms that are going to be spaced anywhere from 6 to 12 months apart. And so, you know, how people are. Uh, it settles down for a few months. You think, aha, we're past it. Next thing you know, pow, you get slammed again. And so the elites are going to come up towards the end of the tribulation, towards the end, actually, of the last cataclysm of the tribulation, which will be when we transit the tail. And that is when they are going to tell people who have survived. Uh, we have vast underground warehouses with food, medicine, clothing, construction materials, everything you need to rebuild and to make life again. All you have to do is agree to our terms. And what the terms are going to be is slavery. That's it. Now, if you have, imagine you've got to go and induce, all right, a population of three, four, five, six billion survivors with what you have limited resources on hand. And people are going, well, hold on a second. You know, you got enough to supply the world for maybe a couple of weeks. You know, we're not going to go for slavery on that basis. But if you have pared down human species to, say, under half a billion, now your little inducements, your trinkets, your baubles, go a lot longer. And your chances of being able to get people to agree to being enslaved are going to be substantially enhanced. And that is the reason why everything that we go and we're seeing today, all of this insanity that doesn't make sense to us, doesn't make sense to us for the same reason that people couldn't believe that they were being hauled off in cattle cars to concentration camps to be slaughtered like cattle. All right. And, but that's the truth of it, because for the elites, it is about maintaining control over the planet. That's what they want. That's the agenda. That's it. Reduce the population. You're going to be able to exert control with whatever resources you have available much more easily. And that's what's really at stake. And this, I guess, really gets to the heart of my mission. You know, what is it that I'm really wanting to do? And it's why I started this church, Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis. And, you know, and does it mean I'm going to change how I do my research with Yowza.com? No. No. Uh, I have been and will always be a born hard geek. <laughs> I follow the truth where it leads me. Right. 
Uh, so this is really more of implementing a faith-based organization, specifically for people that I've been trying to help for, for over a decade, people who've been in awareness for most of their lives. But the point of it is that we want to do three things, all right? And I call it the three precepts of the church. And <clears throat> those are self-sufficiency. That's really important. That is incredibly important, all right? Uh, that's the first one. And you've got to know that you are not alone. All right, that's another of the precepts. These are the two things I want people to have most importantly of the three precepts. And to do that, we want to go on the air with radio. That's what we want to do. And we want to do it specifically after the pull shift because that is when the elites are going to be out of action. All right. And I want to be able to <clears throat> broadcast information to the world and so that they have hope for the future. That's the third precept. So self-sufficiency, hope for the future, and knowledge that you're not alone. And when we're broadcasting information, uh, this actually came as a result of I was working on a project that uh, a gentleman wanted to pitch me to the Discovery Channel for a show. And I had been thinking about Knowledge Mountain and doing this for a long time. And when I told this producer in Hollywood my idea, he said, that's not sexy. And I was like, not sexy? All right, let's go work on that. And then I started thinking about it. And it really was, I went back and I started looking at uh, and listening to radio shows from the Great Depression. And then it dawned on me, what we really have to do is to be entertaining and informative at the same time. So... You know, you find somebody that's really good at solar cells. Then you find someone who can write a radio script and someone who can act out that script. And what you then have is, well, like Amos and Andy. And, but instead of Amos and Andy doing uh, their Stutz Bearcats jokes, they're doing slapstick jokes about solar cells and water pumps and other such things to help people survive. And likewise, uh, you'd have other forms of entertaining information. For example, you could have a soap opera for people, mostly the ladies out there that enjoy them. And, but it would focus around a group of midwives. And in the course of all of the you know, drama stories, I'm leaving him, he's leaving me, or whatever, uh, they're talking about what they do. And they're passing along information about prenatal care, difficult delivery situations, and so forth. And so that there's useful knowledge that's geared to what people are going to have on hand or can scrounge that's going to give them something that they can make their lives better and share it. And, you know, and it's also finding, you know, the guy that can play 22 instruments, write his own songs, and he does some snappy tune about how to filter water with a couple of different things laying around. And... That's the kind of thing that we're doing. And also, one of the things about the communities we're implementing into the designs is that you have to be able to overproduce. Uh, one of the things I see with traditional me and mine preppers, like, you know, I just am interested in me and my family and you can go to hell. Better yet, just go away. Don't ever come around me. Well, that's naive and stupid uh, because eventually your 10-year-old's going to go asleep on guard duty and you're going to wake up as you're hearing your wife being raped as your throat is being slit and your supplies are being stolen. And your, you know, your children are being sold into slavery, or worse yet, you become banquet feast. Uh, no, that doesn't work. And so, if you have a community, community needs to be able to not only produce enough fresh food to feed itself; it needs to produce ten times that much. All right, it really needs to be a farming survival community, but an indoor community, because there's going to be long periods of time during the tribulation when you're not going to be able to work, you know, raise a crop on the soil on the surface. And so if you're doing this and you're doing aquaponics, you can do amazing things with aquaponics. Uh, you can do, you know, you can raise chickens, goats, you can pigs. You can do a lot of amazing things if you set it up the right way with these concrete domes. And then what happens is you begin going out and supplying the communities around you. So let's say you have two towns south of you and two towns to the north of you. You know, what you do is you go and you get in a truck and you load it up with food and you go to the, the second town 
away from you to the south and the second town to way to the north and people in the second town and in the first town go to that point to pick up their food and vice versa and what you do is you create an echelon of support in communities around you and that's one thing that you have to do to be in service to people locally and the other thing that you need to do is to broadcast the information to people who can cobble together a radio and on any kind of frequency any way that you can reach them the end goal of all of this you know as Sun Tzu said don't go to war if you don't know what victory looks like and I have a very clear image in my mind of what victory looks like because we're not political and we're not going to be broadcasting religious message it's about self-sufficiency it's about hope for the future and letting people know they're not alone and here's why it's important when those elites come up from their deep underground bases with their inducements of slavery if the people on the surface have no options a bad deal is better than no deal but if people have self-sufficiency hope for the future and the knowledge that they are not alone they have options and at that point it's just say no and people will understand what that means because when you're dealing with the elites it's not saying no to the carrots it's saying no to the sticks you're going to be punished for it but if enough people can do it and just keep in mind it only took 30 percent of the original colonies to go in the war of you know uh, in our fight for independence from England only took three out of ten Americans to prevail and win that war you don't need everybody you just need enough for a critical mass and if there's a critical mass that comes around of people that just say no then it's calling the bluff because the elites don't have a good hand they'll lose and if that happens if that happens if enough people say no and call the bluff then humanity for the first time in its existence will be a free universally free species we will be unshackled and we will be free to evolve as our creator intends for us to evolve and we will have a Star Trek future that is our pathway to a Star Trek future now conversely if the elites can come up and get and get you know they can get their bluff they can win on a bluff and people just have no options no hope for the future they all feel like they're isolated and they're all alone and they take a bad deal because they feel there's a bad deal is better than you know the best you're going to get if you don't have options we're going to be a slave species for countless generations to come and what's that going to look like what's that going to look like hunger games my friend that is the future the elites want for us hunger games obviously right now there's so many things that are taking place that one might call uh, close to apocalyptic you know there's Fukushima the Gulf oil spill the disaster out there chemtrails fracking all sorts of nasty adjuvants being put into vaccines and then injected into <laughs> babies and you know just so much stuff that's going on around the world many people might consider it to be you know almost like a dark ecstasy per se but well, I, I've talked to Dane Wigginton before as well, and I asked him this question about, well, if these chemtrails are completely destroying the planet and these guys at the top levels know about this, why are they continuing to do it? Wouldn't there be much easier ways to take out 7 billion people or 6.5 billion people than continually destroy the Earth, which is where they're going to need to be in the future anyway? I mean, if they're completely destroying the planet, uh, why, why, would they, why would they do it in such long, drawn-out, intricate means? Because for the same reason that the SS was very careful in covering up what it was doing. And they never said, we're going to kill people. They said things like, we're going to have a final solution. All right. It's the way they think. You take all the cumulative effect of GMO, processed foods, turning our children into human pincushions. All right and a whole host of other things and what they're doing is weakening us 
because <clears throat> the fact is that the vast uh, the vast bulk of humanity lives along a coastline and these are going to be death zones all right and so you're going to have a huge massive loss of life along the shorelines and all they really need to do is make sure that people are there to die and they've done that and done a very very good job of it all right um I, I, you know, it, it's my sad duty to inform you that they really have already won. It's just waiting for the rest of the game to play out because it's, it's a fixed game. All right. Now, with everything that they're doing with processed foods, GMO, um, and a whole host of other things, neurolinguistic programming, it's all things that touch our lives in ways that do not stand out. In a singular basis, all right. Um, but when you take it on a whole and you look at it, then what you see is a total assault. Where what they want to do is make sure that they have destroyed our ability to survive in large numbers. That's what they don't want. They don't want us to survive with two or three billion people or half the population of the globe. They want to reduce it to one in seven, optimally one in ten. All right. So Mother Nature is going to do most of it. And then if everything else doesn't have a smoking gun level of proof, then they get a mulligan. Okay? They get to the kill and they get a mulligan. For them, what could be sweeter? For us, it defies imagination. We can't think of such barbarity. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. And, you know, I knew this. I, I came to this realization back in 2004. 2004, 2005, 2006 were the most, oh God, they were just terrible, depressing years. And living with that realization that this is really what they're doing. But it was in 2009 I had a wonderful, 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 you, you know, <laughs> the universe smiled on me. And we were doing channeling research because of that. And, and what started me on that was when I found out that uh, a lot of Nobel no laureates uh, finally get exhausted with trying to solve things through science. And then they just jump into the paranormal looking for answers. And I figured, well, if it can work for a Nobel laureate, it works for me. And I started doing that. And I had wonderful gifted psychics. We had a scientific approach to it. Uh, we vetted our sources. We would, you know, cross-reference questions. It was very elaborate. And, you know, one day, though, with one of this one gal, it's a wonderful, wonderful channel. And she was one of those people that could just bring in any level of entities. So she could do extraterrestrials and in incarnated and unincarnated. Incarnated is uh, a spirit that is incarnated in human form. Unincarnated is that they have never incarnated in human form. And we were having a great analysis, and I was really, really kind of sad thinking about all of this. I had found a way to, to kind of grip it. And I was, you know, at that time, I was just, well, it ain't over till the fat lady sings, so we'll see what we do. It wasn't a matter of, you know, faith and creator at that time for me. I was very more in a worldly view. And, you know, I shared with her this, and she said, well, let's, let's see if somebody has something to say. And I said, okay. And so we started a session, and a guide came in by the name of Serapis Bay. And Serapis Bay is an ascended master. Um and uh, was uh, a high priest in Egyptian temple thousands of years ago. And so here was what Serapis Bey said to me that brought a lot of relief and joy into my life. And he said, Marshall, the book of humanity's evolution is large. And it is not fully written. And as with all books, it is many chapters. This chapter belongs to the elites, the powerful. They own this chapter 
of the human story. And there's nothing you can do to take it away from them. So do not even bother to try. Just accept that it is theirs to take. However, what they understand is that the next chapter in the story of humanity does not belong to them. And that the only way they can extend their control of this world is by bluffing you into giving it to them. And that was the insight Serapis Bay gave me. And that has consistently been, you know, a guiding light in looking at all of this. Yes, that's what they're doing. They're setting us up to fail. They're getting ready to set up their bluff because they want to extend their control. And it's going to work. That is, unless enough people at the end of it all stand up to them and just say no. That's it. Just say no. And they lose. And we win our freedom. And that has always been for me life affirming. That was the day my life changed, actually. And it was the day my mission changed. But then there was another day that was also life-changing for me in terms of looking at we have seven billion souls on the planet and these maniacal monsters want to kill as many of them as possible that you know living with that kind of knowledge really hurts and one day with this very same gal she's wonderfully Wonderful, wonderful gal. She was uh, in her early 40s with a husband who was very loving and supporting of her gift, and that's very important. And you know, she, as with all of the psychics that we worked with, she did she she gave her service freely. There was nobody was ever compensated. Nobody ever asked for it or wanted it. And we were working with extraterrestrials at that particular time, and it was interesting with. Uh, incarnated and unincarnated spirits because after we did a reading with them the last question was always give us a weather event six to twelve months out that we can use to verify your uh, the quality of your information and what I can tell you is that with the entities we were communicating with every one of them was right on the money they would tell us about a typhoon a tsunami something would happen I, they would give us a six to twelve month out prediction on a on a really observable serious weather event and boom i mean just like clockwork uh... it would come to pass but with extraterrestrial entities we didn't have that ability and uh... and what was interesting in dealing with the ets that we were bringing in because um, this form of communication is actually what's prevalent throughout the rest of the uh, galaxy. And we were talking with them, and they seemed to have a repetitive mantra. It didn't matter which, uh, and we had multiple sensitives we worked with, and uh, we would be in contact with multiple different species on opposite ends of the solar system. And the conversation actually always uh, was about the same. They were always saying, look, you guys are at a fork in the road. Uh, you know, it's, if you ever have a chance to read up on the Hopi Prophecy Rock, it really pretty well summarizes their message. They were giving us the Hopi Prophecy Rock message. That humanity is at a fork in the road, and if we have the courage to go in a new direction, then it's going to be very good for us. And if we don't have the courage to go in a new direction, then we are going to suffer for countless generations to come and it's not going to end well for us eventually and this was a consistent message that we had from all these extraterrestrial species that we were in communication with again and again and again didn't matter which sensitive which species which end of the universe always the same message choose wisely and you know in this one particular session that we were doing this one channeling reading and I just I just finally decided to ask the question because it, we were talking to uh, an entity uh, that was very engaging. And so I said, last question. You're on the other side of the galaxy. You know, we're never going to see each other. 
<laughs> There's too much distance here. Um, and you've given us all this wonderful information. Thank you so much. But excuse me for asking, but why? What's in it for you? What's in it for you? Why bother? The answer I got simply floored me. Here's the answer. This ET said, in a half of one of your centuries, you have gone from two billion souls on your planet to seven. And yet, your planet only has two billion native souls. The other five billion are from everywhere else in the galaxy. We are interested in you because you have our ancestors. They have incarnated in your planet at this time to help you evolve. And that was, for me, that, that, that was just, you know, <laughs> thump, who to thunk it, you know? You have a, you have a V8 moment. Oy, I could have had a V8. Did you notice their thought processes, the way that they responded? Did some seem more articulate or some more mechanical? Uh, very articulate. And, you know, there's, there's good, bad, and ugly out there. And you do have to know the difference. All right. And so when you, you know, you have ascended spirits, you have light spirits, you have dark spirits. And when you're working with, you know, for example, there's uh, a lot of people believe that, you know, fortune telling is very dangerous and you shouldn't do it. And actually there's truth to that. Because the problem with fortune telling is it's usually going to be something that is accessible to more devolved lower order spirits. And, you know, when you're dealing it on the right plane, when you're talking with ascended guides, all right, and you're talking about talking with uh, well advanced, you know, species of extraterrestrials. It's a different conversation. You know how to set up your own firewalls. You know how to protect yourself, and it's important. So, uh, like the old saying goes on TV, "Don't try this at home." <laughs> All right, <laughs> uh, you have to be very, very careful when you do this. Very, very careful. And you know, for those out there that want to do this, you can. Uh, it opens up a whole world to you, uh, and it's, you know, part of it is that, yes, you can, you can talk to Creator. You can talk to God. It's not impossible. It's very easy, actually. Uh, the problem comes in that people, because of their own naivety or uh, bias, are going to be susceptible to dark spirit entities that are going to want to hijack them. That's a real concern. There are dark spirit entities out there, and it's, you know, people tend to want to look at agendas, and you're, you know, for this guy, you're against that guy, you want to, you know, nah, that's not the way it works, all right? These are spirits that are devolving, they're going, there's only two ways you go. You go to creator, or you go away from creator. That's it. <laughs> And that's all. When you're going to Creator, you're creating prana, life force energy. You're in a loving state. Uh, when you're going away from Creator, you're consuming energy. And so what dark entities really are looking to do is they are needing to feed. That's really what they want to do. That's all they want to do. They just want to feed. And uh, they're looking for people who they can get in and interfere with their lives and cause disharmony, anger, all kinds of problems. Because when you are having a fear-based emotion, you start releasing prana, life force energy, chi or ki, whatever you want to call it. But you start releasing it. And when you do that, then they're, you know, they're just right there <laughs> slurping it up because that's something that they don't have when they're devolving. And... You know, it's uh, a very dark place that these uh, spirits are in, and it's a very dark path because they are in a state of devolution or, you know, they're descending, if you will. And at, you know, the two ends of the scale, you have creator on one side and on the other side, you have oblivion. That's it, the void. And uh, if you descend into the void, that's, that's it, game over. It's as though you never existed. And 
that's what they're struggling to stay away from is that final descent into the void. And in order to do that, they are going to be parasitic and cause as much problems for people as they can. So it is something where you have to be incredibly careful in how you do it. You need to be well-schooled and mentored. I came through the Native American tradition of the Vision Quest, and I spent six months being mentored in my own abilities and learning the, the wisdom of the medicine wheel. And I think Native Americans have uh, a stellar approach to how to do this and how to do it safely. Um, for those of us in the West that want to do it, I actually recommend that if you want to try this and you're not already doing this, um, begin with remote viewing. Don't try to go straight into channeling. Remote viewing and channeling are both similar in that they are right brain activity. This is where the information comes in. This is your portal is on the right hemisphere. And with remote viewing, you're essentially tapping into, well, Ed Dames, and I took his class, excellent. I found I had a nice, uh, I had, remote viewing comes naturally to me. And uh, it, it's a very valuable survival skill. I would definitely recommend it to anyone. It's also, I think, an excellent place to start if you wa eventually want to go into channeling. Uh, remote viewing was developed uh, by intelligence agencies during the Cold War and in the United States and in Russia. Uh, both the United States and Russia use psychics, which is a form of channeling, if you will, and they also use remote viewers. Uh, the difference being that in the United States, they principally use, they, they favor remote viewers over psychics, and in Russia, they favor psychics over remote viewer. The difference being is that uh, you can turn anyone into a remote viewer and get a basic amount of quality information. The best intelligence will come from a psychic, but that is something where you're looking at natural gifts and it's a much more laborious selection and uh, development process. So uh, you could say, you know, our intelligence agencies have gone in favor of mass production <laughs> and the Russians went the other way, but still the same, both intelligence agencies do both things. Now, uh, Ed Dames, uh, when you're doing remote viewing, he, he says you're tapping into what he calls the matrix, or if you will, the Akashic Record, the Book of Life. And uh, it's a very powerful technique, and you can use it to visualize uh, areas of safety, uh, you know, finding people. Ed Dames goes around now and uh, does a lot of work on finding children who've been abducted and died and finding their remains so that they can be uh, interred uh, and the families can have closure. Um, if you start with remote viewing, you don't have to worry about being compromised by imposter dark spirits or just want to feed off your prana. That's the huge advantage of remote viewing. And uh, because you're tapping into the universe um, in a way that is very safe relative to channeling. Channeling is more advanced. It's kind of like the difference between an SUV and a, a Ferrari sports car. And obviously you can pile up in the Ferrari a lot faster at 300 miles an hour or whatever than you would an SUV going down the freeway. And those are, you know, genuine concerns. But uh, you will learn discipline. You will, uh, you will learn when you are filtering. That is one of the real problems people have when they're doing either remote viewing or they're doing channeling or psychic work is uh, you are imposing an agenda. You want to see an outcome. You know, you're, you're just simply not going at it objectively. And within the case of remote viewing, what you happening is uh, you're actually you don't know what you're reviewing you don't you don't know what you're viewing until after you've viewed it all right so someone else is deciding a target and you're remote viewing that target and so the remote viewing is a fabulous way to develop uh, your first off your own sensitivity to what's happening in your mind and how you're able to do this it gives you tremendous discipline uh, it helps you to shield out your own tendency to want to filter or to come at this with an agenda which is going to bias the results. You know, like, okay, God, you know, where did Uncle Harry bury the money? 
And, you know, that kind of bias, it'll teach you how to filter that out. And then from remote viewing, after you've felt a sense of mastery in that, then you go to the next step. Now, when you go into channeling, you definitely want to work with someone who's going to mentor you. This is not something, it's not a do-it-yourself kind of thing. You really need to be mentored and brought along, and you have to be patient and take time. Because opening up the channel and communicating, that is fairly easy. It's getting the discipline to make sure that you are accurately conveying the knowledge you're receiving and that you are properly shielding yourself from being hijacked by imposter dark spirits. I'm glad you brought up remote viewing. I had the opportunity to speak with Dick Algeyer, which is one of the leading remote viewers in the world. Um, he's a part of the Farsight Institute. I think he used to be mm -hmm. the, the vice president for the Hawaiian Remote Viewers Guild. And it's incredible how accurate um, those guys are. Um, Daz Smith also very accurate. Courtney Brown, the uh, uh, founder of the Farsight Institute. It's, mm -hmm. it's just incredible. And they claim that there's no psychic ability to it whatsoever. It's just all done with you know certain applications and it's just it's amazing. Uh, yes, that is the beauty of remote viewing. There is nothing spiritual about it. It is a purely scientific method. Okay? That's the reason why I like it. It's a beautiful if you want to go into if you want to do psychic work, all right, and you're inclined to go that way, uh, if you start with remote viewing, you're it's it's a very safe and disciplined way to enhance your own abilities and skills absolutely now with the elections getting pretty close here and donald trump seems to have so much attention in the media right now you've got uh some other you know situations with jeb bush he doesn't really seem to be doing much in the elections right now it seems like hillary clinton every other day something you know negative pr comes out about her but I'm thinking of Ross Perot, and I'm thinking of how close he got to the uh, possibility of making it into the presidency, and then it seems like he just changed his mind overnight. Now, whether he was threatened or what, I don't know. But, I mean, you would think— He was threatened. That's was what threatened. I would think. I voted for Perot. Yeah. And um, he was a fresh breeze, uh, and what happened was uh, George Bush uh, basically threatened to kill his business. He was running this massive company in Texas, EDS, and I was living in Texas at the time. Or actually, I was living in California. And uh, so he had to back off. And then he basically came back in as a spoiler. And he was able to pull enough of the votes away that Clinton was able to uh, win against Bush. Now, do you think that Trump is being set up as you know a, a, an alternative motive or do you think that he really has a shot to to make it i you know when it comes to the political thing first off i just we don't have an honest process anymore <laughs> okay i mean major corporations can go in and pollute the environment with so much money that uh the little guy no longer counts and so you know, it's it all has the appearance of looking like it's on the up and up. All we can say about Donald Trump is, uh, yeah, he speaks his mind. He's interesting, but he could just be a floor show. Right. Or maybe, you know, some type of staged opposition. Now, another thing that has been on many people's minds lately that I've spoken with is these you know shootings that are taking place it seems like almost every other day there's a mass shooting that's being publicized in the mainstream news the brain drain media but mm -hmm. if you actually watch the footage it seems as if many of the people that are victims or family members victims are the same victims of previous encounters and then you start doing research on crisis actors and you you really break down these shootings and there's so much contradicting data, it's, it's almost impossible to know what to believe. However, if they are real shootings, 
then how come there's no solid evidence and that all the stuff we're seeing is is just seems like this you know b-rated movie and info that's compiled together to where if you're knowledgeable about the situation you're going to know pretty much right off the bat that it's something's fishy there but if you're plugged into the borg per se you're just going to believe it and if you are if you meet somebody that doesn't agree with you well then they're going to you know call you a conspiracy theorist and they'll just shut you right out and oh man right. guys alone right and that's really what they're doing. Um, all of this is engineered to put them in a better position. And, you know, they want to take guns away. That's confiscations is going to be huge. You know. You think it's going to happen? It's, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, no. I mean. How far out? Oh, I don't think, I don't think we're that far out. I think Bob Fletcher is absolutely spot on when he says, we know that Nibiru is going to be visible to everybody on the planet because six months before that, they will find a, an excuse for martial law. And so I, you know, I look what's happening and how we are turning into a fascist state and we're slipping into it. You know, just when, for example, when I came to Reno, I went to go get my Nevada driver's license and so I just had to have a second form of ID and ten dollars and I had a license and now you have to get a federal certification process Jennifer when we caught here went to go get her license it cost her forty five dollars for her license but she had to have all her birth certificates marriage certificates divorce certificate everything just tons of stuff a signed lease I mean she had to go with a thick file folder just to go get a driver's license, all right? And we are slipping into a fascist state, and all of this is to give them pretext for, you know, when they go in to make their moves. But here's the upshot of it. What I see coming down the pike is a period that I call, right now, the period that I see myself in and with the people that I'm working with is a time that I call the gathering, all right? And I'm pulling people together into small communities and get them out of the line of fire, get them into safe areas and just hunker in the bunker, make life, help everybody that we can around us the best way we can. But for most people, everything's just going to come on them all of a sudden. I'm talking about the same people that are telling people like you and your listeners out there, it's all boo, nothing's going to happen and I don't want to hear about it. Okay. Have you heard that before? Of course. Of course. These are the ones that all of a sudden are going to be raising their fists and going, rah, rah, rah. okay. And you know what? When you see a crowd, they're going to go march on a federal building and they're going to go snort and stomp and scream about their constitutional rights and all of that. You know where you want to be? as far away from those fools as you can. I'm talking about you are running and screaming feet. Don't fail me now. Because what will happen is when it's during martial law, they'll go out, they'll form their picket lines, and they'll be yelling and screaming, and they'll come on the loudspeaker, and they're going to say, you must disband and go home. And then people, of course, are going to go, you know, up yours, rah, 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 rah. And then they're going to say again, you must disband to go home. And people are going to go, up yours, rah, rah, rah. And then guess what? That's when they, why do you think our government has bought 1.8 billion rounds of hollow point small arms ammunition? They will open up on the crowds and mow them down. Mow them down. And there are going to be thousands of people slaughtered that way. And all they need is a couple of those kind of events, and you're going to have a Kent State effect. For those of you who are my age, you remember Kent State. And during the Vietnam War, we had all of the protests that were going on and on and on and on and on. And those protests actually uh, is what cost us the war. We didn't lose it. In Vietnam, we won every battle on the ground. We lost it on the streets of America. And so what they did was they were just waiting for an opportunity. And sure enough, here comes along Kent State. They take a bunch of National Guardsmen who 
there was no money to train the guard. All they actually did on the weekends, I know, I was in the guard during Vietnam. You just went, showed up in the morning, had an inspiring speech from your sergeant, crawled under a truck, slept. When they called chow, you came out, you ate. After that, you went back under the truck, played cribbage, whatever you're going to do. And then on Sunday, the sergeant would put you all together and say, man, you did a brilliant job today. We're proud of the great training. And that's how the guard was trained during Vietnam. So they take a bunch of these guys and they hand them M14s and uh, put them in a bunch of, a bunch of front, you know, a bunch of kids. And sure enough, they know what's going to happen. And it did. And probably provocateurs were somewhere in there to organize it. And then, pow, they started shooting kids with uh, 30-odd-6 rifles. Tears hell out of a body. Scared and stunned the whole country. And what happened after Kent State? That was the end of the protests. Protests were no longer fashionable because they would get you dead. And so it'll be the same thing here. And you don't want to be one of the human sacrifices for the rage because that's going to come. That's going to happen. And, um, you know, uh, so when I, you know, I see all of these people, and they're telling you, you know, it's nonsense. Nothing's going to happen. I don't want to hear about it. They're the ones going to be eating the bullets. And uh, not going to be very pleasant bullets because the government, interestingly enough, the kind of ammunition that they bought is hollow point ammunition, which is illegal. You cannot arm your military with, and this is by treaty, you, can arm, you cannot arm them with hollow point ammunition because hollow point just tears hell out of the body. Dumb, dumb slugs. Oh, they're awful. But you can arm your police forces. That's, uh, that's something that, you know, it's a little caveat in the law. And so, and they are going to use it. So when you look at the political process, I mean, you know, so, uh, frankly, I don't even, I don't even know that we're going to have another president or another election. Well, you know, Syria is a uh, hot zone right now. The Middle East is is going crazy. You've got millions of refugees scattering across, uh, you know, European countries like Germany. And when you see the actual video footage of these people, uh, most of them look like uh, men in their, you know, twenties, early thirties, and you know, they look like prime fighting age. And I am really under the impression that they're they're doing this once again as a controlled way to bring in uh, different cultures and cause this clash between, you know, Christians and Muslims and, and just other people that are out there that don't have any religious preference at all that, you know, see themselves just basically losing rights for, you know, Germany's giving housing up to these guys and kicking people out. And if you complain mm -hmm. about it in Germany and put it on uh, social media, the, they'll lock you up. Uh, do, yep. you, do you think it's getting close to World War Three as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to have, you know, look at it again, you know, the simplistic, the, the diabolical simplicity of it. If you're going to reduce the population of 7 billion people, you know, killing 7 billion people, that's a lot of people you got to kill, right? If you want to weed that down to one-tenth that population, that's hard. You have to have it, you know, there's, there's no one magic bullet that's going to do it all not without turning the whole surface into something that's completely unusable and unlivable. You know, remember, they don't want to come up and rule a wasteland. They want to come up and rule a viable, productive world. And so you just have all of these layers of, of things that are happening. But another element that comes into it is that, like the Nazis used to say in World War II, it was one of their favorite sayings, nothing ever goes according to plan. And so that's part of what we're seeing here, too. Uh, we are seeing things are not going according to plan. Uh, it's not unfolding as easily for the elites as they thought it would. That's where the dangers really lie. That's the reason why, you know, it's getting, getting mixed up in any of this at this point is why, why waste your blood? Why waste your children? You know, focus with... Uh, you know, surviving with like-minded others and 
staying clear of all this because there's just going to be a lot of death, a lot of carnage. None of it's going to make any sense. None of it's going to serve, you know, there's nothing noble about it. Uh, we haven't fought an honest war since probably Korea. And ever since then, it's just we've been in corporate wars. You know, you got to move out that old inventory of bombs. <laughs> Go find a war somewhere. Just start killing people. You don't need a reason. And that's what we do. When was the last time we really had a genuine victory? Think about it, you know. I mean, you had Reagan had Granada. Well, that was quick. That was, you know, a lot of good press and it was a quickie. Um, and then, you know, our first Gulf War. We went out there and thumped Saddam Hussein. But look what we created as a result. I mean, it's just... Uh, and then I look and see what's happening right now with the tensions between uh, Russia, China, and the United States. Yeah, the world is polarizing between East and West. And we, you know, we're not the good guys anymore. We really aren't. And we're out there, we're exploiting third world countries. If you look at the AIIB that the Chinese have formed, this new banking system, you know, what they're really going to offer the third world is a win-win deal, okay? Uh, it's not like you go to the IMF and you get loans. Most of the money goes to American multinationals, which then go into your country, build out all kinds of stuff, hang you with the bill, and then you can't pay it because you've been set up to fail. And then that in turn is used to exploit your resources for pennies on the dollar. So it's a banking colonial, you know, it's a colonial takeover through banking. It's a really evil system. And uh, the way that operates. So these things are, you know, these things are really playing against us. And on one hand, people would want to live here because we have a good quality of life. But on the other hand, uh, we're not all that terrific when it comes to quality of life for other nations. However, to me, all of this is pretty much moot. I mean, I, I, what I am seeing is the end of a civilization. That's what's happening. And you know, we're going down the tubes like Rome did. When you have eight individuals, eight human beings, who possess amongst themselves as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion souls on the planet. What's wrong with that picture? Okay? Eight people possess as much wealth as 3.5 of the billion, 3.5 billion of the poorest. That is sad in a staggering conception, but it's also part of the cycle of empire. It's why empires always fail. They always do. No empires survive forever. They all plan to have a thousand year reign and they all plan all kinds of stuff and they always fail because empires are based on acquisition and exploitation. They're resource driven, scarcity models. And so an empire rises quickly when everybody has a chance to get a piece of the pie. That's the reason why America rose quickly. There was so much opportunity. You know, people could come from Europe and go out west and get a mule in 40 acres. And they could start a life. I mean, it was amazing, amazing opportunities that built the country. Not anymore today. We're, we're basically a stratified in the United States in terms of, you know, low income versus high income as the, the caste system in India. Um, but what happens with empires is they rise up quickly while everybody gets a piece of the action. And then what happens is it hits a point where, you know, the spoils are not so easy to take anymore. And once that happens, then comes a downward consolidation. And this is where the elite, powerful people begin taking control and wealth to themselves. And they do it for no other reason than they just have a hunger. They want more. That's all. They just want more. They can never get enough. There's, you know... It boggles the mind that, you know, like Jeff Bezos was at like $16 billion in income last year. It, it, there comes a point where where can you spend it? What can you do with it? 
I mean, you can spend half your life becoming a multi-billionaire, and then you spend the other half of your life trying to give most of that away. Well, can you imagine, you're not going to succeed. You imagine if you had that kind of money, Marshall, you could set up these, uh, you know, communities that you're talking about all around the globe. Oh man, in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. You know, it's, I, I <laughs> uh, that would nothing would make me happier, and I want to see. You know, to me, I believe in reincarnation. Okay, and. I don't want to reincarnate into a Hunger Games world. It's as simple as that. But it's also part of, you know, on my website, uh, you can read an article titled God's Mission and Planet X, in which I actually, there's where I talk about my belief of perpetual genesis for the first time. And it's, I see myself, I'm here, I'm in this time. I'm incarnated in this species. And I'm in service to Creator. And what Creator needs, Creator wants, because Creator's mission is perpetual genesis, the creation of life from the lifelessness of the void. That's it. And you need co-creators to do that. And that, those are ascended masters. And ascended masters need some place to go and learn the material world. And so they need species that are evolved. And if humanity can take a step forward in its evolution, we are going to evolve and we're going to be able to host more advanced entities and spirits. The more advanced souls can incarnate with us. And that furthers Creator's mission of bringing life to the lifelessness of the void. And so for me, it's not about here, Earth, and Earth centric views. It's just simply I say to Creator, okay, I'm with you. The mission is bringing life to the lifelessness of the void. I'm in it with you. I'm in it in this life, in this incarnation, in this species, and at this time. And when my job is finished here, then move me on to where you need me. Next species, next planet, next incarnation, next time. And so forth and so forth. Because my pledge is not when I'm here. My pledge is, is eternal. This is it. That's me just saying to Creator, I'm with you all the way. And so it's a cosmic view of everything that's going on. That's how I see it. And I see the promise of our species. And I love our species. People, I have to take one at a time. We all have to. But I love our species. If for no other reason than if we don't love ourselves, who will? But we are an enlightened species. And we have amazing potentials as a species. You know, everyone is like, oh, we're going to have a tribulation and we're going to go into a dark ages and it's going to be Mad Max and all of this and it's going to be awful and terrible. And Well, there's going to be that. But, you know, these, uh, <laughs> these defective people are not going to rule the day. They will burn themselves out because they cannot create positive things. They can only feed off those who can. And those who can will find ways to just simply defend themselves or be elsewhere and let the parasites die. I see a period of enlightenment, okay? Yeah, we're all, oh my gosh, the power plants are going to shut down. How, you know, we're not going to get the light bulbs to go. We're not going to get a radio to work. When this is, what are we going to do with this? We have a lot of knowledge. We have 7 billion souls on the planet. We've got critical mass. It's why 5 billion souls have come from other species and other planets across the galaxies incarnating now just to give this species sufficient critical mass to push through, to soldier on, to take that huge evolutionary step forward that the Hopi, Hopi Prophecy Rock tells us we need to do. All right? And that all of prophecy needs, tells us that we need to do. And, you know, one of the things I look forward to seeing is invention. You know, there's initiative, there's invention and insight. I call it the three eyes. We're going to see that. And it's going to be absolutely marvelous. Yeah, we're going to have awful, terrible times. But we're going to have people with initiative. Folks that are just going to see something needs to be done, and they're going to do it. It could be a grandmother that sees a bunch of kids that are orphaned, and she gathers them together and says, kids, let's hold hands. We're going to just, we're going to go through this together. It's going to be beautiful initiative like that. Then we're going to have invention. 
Imagine what would happen. We see all of these stories today, all of these stories all across the world of people who are coming up with free energy devices, alternative energy devices, ways to, you know, eliminate the mind sucking wallet sucking body sucking nightmare of big pharma and big energy and all of these special interests well during the pole shift event all that gets flattened and who's left standing a nation of nikola teslas we're going to have people inventing things coming up with ideas and freely sharing it with people because they're going to understand this is what we need to do we need to stop screwing each other for a buck you see, we're going to know we've evolved. I'm going to paint that picture of that moment for you. When we as a species know we have evolved because we're not screwing each other for a buck because our lives are about acquisition and exploitation. It's when we replace all of that. What's most important to us is not acquisition. You know, like we're a bunch of damn Ferengi. <laughs> What's the most important thing to us is harmony. Harmony within ourselves and with all that is about us. And when that is universal, when enough of us believe this way to create a critical mass that changes the future of this species, we have evolved. That is what success looks like. Harmony. Not acquisition. Harmony. And, you know, there are a lot of people who have wonderful visions. There's a gentleman, his name is Jacques Fresco, and uh, the Venus Project. And I would really recommend that your readers check into that. There's the, uh, there's the Ubuntu movement. There, I see the beautiful things that are happening. You know, we tend to have a media that focuses on lies and misrepresentations. I look at CNN, I agree with Larry King. They should change their name to the Cartoon News Network. You know, I worked with CNN in the 80s. I was a CNN science feature producer. And back then, it was a lean, mean news machine. I was really proud of being involved with that. And now I look at them and they're just shame. It's just shameful. It's just shameful. They don't do any original reporting. They just simply spew whatever the elitist teletype machine tells them to spew. And uh, so, we, you know, we're not going to get the truth from them. No way, no how. You get to get truth from people like you, all right? And knock on wood, you're still on the air. So I have hope for humanity because once we are free of the shackles, our ability to do amazing things through, you know, initiative, invention, and insight is going to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And that's the future that I look at. That's what I strive for. You know, if it's just hunker in the bunker and you just want to survive because you're just afraid of death and, you know, that's 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 the end all be all of your existence, you're a pretty pathetic person. And you're not going to make it. You've you've certainly spoke some wise words here tonight, Marshall. Uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to live inside of a tube bunker with uh, MREs and no way to move around. That wouldn't be life at all. I mean, that would be punishment, in my opinion. So, you know, good, good information and uh, really appreciate you coming out here tonight with us here at the Leak Project. Um, please keep us updated with your work. Uh, those that are listening, check out Marshall's work at YOWUSA.com. And also, Marshall, before you take off tonight, if you have any other links uh, that you can give our listeners, that would be fantastic. Yes, if you get out to my website and uh, you can find, uh, there's two things that would be good for you, is there will be a link, and if you could post it for at the top of the page for relocation webinars. I know that there's a lot of you that need to bust a move and to get someplace safe. And the relocation webinars are inexpensive. It's personalized attention. It's also a great way to hear other people and what they're going through so that you know you're not alone. And so for those of you who want, to want that information as to ideas of places of safety and a strategy on how to get there, it's surprising what you can do on a little budget, by the way.
then please check it out. Check that link out at the top of my page at yowza.com. Also, you can get there at marshallmasters.com, and it's relocation webinars at the top. Well, it's been great to have you on the show tonight with us, Marshall. Look forward to speaking with you again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take thank care. you. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord for the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts. Or you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.leadproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? If you have information that the world needs to see and hear, send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Dot com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night. <laughs>
And I've always just wanted them to know, that, you know, you're not alone. It's I can see for them that they can feel alone. They can get picked on. Uh, myself, you know, my my work is my life. I do this 24-7, so to speak, seven days a week. And so I'm always talking to people who are in awareness, and I never have that feeling of being alone. And, you know, one lady actually summed it up for me beautifully. She said, I'm a healer casting my pearls before swine, and I walk amongst them, healing them, and yet I cannot heal myself. And so we want to help them, but we also want to be able to gather them together into communities and sustainable communities of 100 or more people. And so right now I've got something called the Dome Community Working Group. And I've got a wonderful team of really motivated people who are working with me on this. And yeah, it's a struggle, but everyone understands that. And it's also something where we feel a sense of mission with Creator and in planning and creating the leadership necessary for these communities. I have spent the entire summer crisscrossing the country doing regional reconnaissance all the way from northwest Minnesota to northeast Washington. And uh, it's been interesting what I have found along the way, that there is a very strong perceptible shift in the country. For example, one of the things that Jennifer noticed when we were traveling was that we saw more American flags on the sides of chemical plants than we did on t-shirts. You know, stop and think about wow. that. Uh, what was amazing for me, particularly up in the Northwest, was uh, how the people up there have shifted. And because I was always asking everybody, everywhere I went, you know, well, how's the weather? and whatever is going on. Now, this has been a horrible summer with record droughts, record heat waves, record fire seasons. And there was no bravado. No bravado. Oh, it's just a bad year. Next year will be better. Everyone I talked to, and I don't care if it was a rancher, a truck driver, a, you know, a waitress, a hotel clerk, everyone knew the earth is changing for the worse, and it's not going to get better. And they were all deeply unsettled about it. And so there is this new awareness that is coming around and to the country. And so it was, uh, it was a very sad trip. We saw a lot of devastation from the fires. Uh, we passed through cities where they have chemical plants that are processing the, uh, what, they're, what all these fracking wells are bringing out of the ground. And like in Billings, Montana, and it's just, oh, my God, awful. You pass through there, and it just almost starts to burn your uh, nostrils. Your eyes start to uh, burn. It just was awful. It's like we wanted to get through Billings as fast as we could. And so when we got back to Sparks, it was this trip that left me sad because of what I had seen and how things are changing. So uh, the bravado is gone. People are waking up. I saw that as a huge difference. And I think things are moving in that direction. So, you know, with doing the Dome Community Working Group, what we're really doing right now is creating the expertise pool and strategic solutions for what I call rapid deployment communities. There's not going to be the time of, you know, two years or three years to build out a large community. You're going to have to be able to build these communities out in two or three months. And that's what we're doing. And so, uh, you know, the core concept, building concept of the communities will be concrete domes. And we like the dome technology that was developed by David South of uh, monolithic domes in Italy, Texas. And that's what we're doing on that. And uh, the, basically, the Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis will be a way for us to gather together the people who are in awareness and to help them. So it's one of those things that's, uh, we're going on faith, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. So <laughs> that's what we're doing. But I'm, you know, I'm tired of this chicken little nonsense. Well, and your location, uh, your headquarters for your church or um, the, where it's located, do you have the, the dome there as well or multiple domes? No. Up? No, we don't, you know, right now what we're really doing with the working group is, is just pulling together people who have different 
uh, avenues of expertise. So we're going through all of the strategic planning right now. In other words, how do you bring a community together of 100 people? Uh, what technologies can we do on a rapid deployment basis? So as things progress, all right, people are going to be waking up and they're going to be looking for solutions. And this is not the time to start doing a lot of research. You need to be able to hit the ground running. So that's what we're doing with the working group right now is putting ourselves in a position that when people are waking up and they're ready to actualize that we can say, here you go. And actually what we're going to do with this is it's not proprietary. I'm not interested in you know, one of these, aha, you got to come to us and buy it. What we're actually doing as a working group is taking all this information, pulling it together, creating a unified threat matrix, which is the basis of what you're going to use for your planning. And all that information will be published in a substantial new book I will put out this year. And uh, the title of that will be, well, the working title of the book right now is Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, Getting Through It with Family, Friends, and Faith-Based Organizations. Because at this point, uh, I believe that the best chances for people in terms of survival are going to be by organizing through faith-based organizations. FBOs have a real huge advantage. One, uh, an FBO is got an established hierarchy, uh, you know, and this is one of the things that you see in a lot of for-profit and also non-faith-based organizations that are intent on survival is that y you get into power struggles. With an FBO, you're not going to have the power struggles because you have an existing chain of command that people will respect. That's really important. Uh, the second thing is that with a faith-based organization, they can pull resources together quickly, real quickly, okay? And if you're doing a for-profit operation, you know, every step along the way, you got to make sure you're protecting the investor's money and they're going to see a return and all of that. With a church, a faith-based organization, it's, hey, we're going to go do this. And things just start happening. And they happen quickly. And then another thing that FBOs have a real significant advantage with is that they have a diversity of talent, a huge diversity of talent. And people don't realize that. But you go to a church and the person next to you is you know, if you're a dentist, they could be an electrical contractor. The guy next to you is, uh, you know, in the construction trade. The lady in front of you is a doctor. Someone behind you specializes in aquaponic systems. In other words, that's the beautiful thing about a church. It brings people from numerous walks of life. Well, that's excellent. And then you also have folks that have come to be able to be innovative and to take initiative and show things. You know, you got, you know, you got that little old lady that boy, every year she runs one heck of a killer bake sale, raises a lot of money. And, you know, she's got that initiative. She's got that gumption. And so you're bringing that kind of talent as well. So that's the reason why I think in terms of late stage deployment, faith-based organizations, churches in particular, have a huge survival advantage. For the rest, I see a lot of problems. I look at the commercial offerings and man, it's just, it's just not good. Uh, you see, first off, there's uh, one big thing that's popular is that they use these pipes, all right? Because these big pipes that you use for irrigation and culverts and whatnot convert very well and they're very inexpensive. The problem with them is that you can't bury them that deep in the ground. And while under a, I would say, uh, a Cold War threat matrix, it, you want to be at least five feet under the ground. And what we're looking at, you want to be 10 feet under the ground. And that's not something I would want to be uh, 10 feet under the ground in a corrugated tube. But also, you have a corrugated tube that you look at the pictures and people are sitting there in their little bunks with big smiles and their sterile white little tubes. These things are about as inviting and about as comfortable as a World War II submarine. Right. And, you know, the crews in World War II knew that every 90 days they'd have to go back to base for torpedoes and fuel. But if you're going to be in that bunker for a few years, 
holy schmoly. I mean, uh, what what will happen is those things are going to turn into suicide tubes. And then you have the other commercial structures, which are these big uh, converted military bunkers. And these are single large rooms that were designed for taking a missile impact and surviving through that. They weren't designed to survive a sinkhole or a major fault fracture. And the thing of it is, is that they take these things and they turn them into basically glorified wood mahogany dormitories. And the designs are often awkward because of the layout so you could be on one side of the door, you know, you could be in the sleeping quarters and you'd have to pass through the entire sleeping quarters and kitchen area and dining area to get to the bathrooms, you know, which is really not pleasant in the middle of the night. And you don't know who's going to wind up in the sleeping room next to you. You know, it could be somebody with the worst case of sleep apnea in the history of humankind, and that's going to go right through those thin walls. Or it could be a drug dealer who... Uh, you know, has brought a nice stash of drugs to get through the end times with. And of course, all of these companies say you know, they screen everybody. And let's be honest, when it's for profit, the screening is, does the check clear the bank? Right. And these are the problems that I see with a lot of these structures. And the reason why we went with concrete domes is concrete domes are ancient and they take a licking and keep on ticking. And the way we're designing our communities when we come out with our book is that 